So rugby union, in my extremely unbiased opinion, is the greatest sport on earth, followed closely by nothing because it's just the best. But the sport we all know and love has only really been professional for about 24 years, which compared to a lot of the other big sports is very recent, with baseball having its first professional league start in 1871, American football, a sport evolved from rugby going pro in the early 1890s along with basketball and normal football just a couple years before that. And that seemed to be an era where the possibility of a career in professional sport became an actual reality. But for the very keen eyed and eared ones of you, the 1800s is a little further in the past than 1995. So where was good old ruggers when most of the world had the eureka moment about making money in sport? Well, that's what I'm here to explain. So let's put our red gilets on, get into our DeLoreans, and talk about how rugby turned professional. So in a previous video of mine I discussed the split of rugby union and rugby league, which I hear is an excellent piece of art. Anyway, the main crux of why the two sports split was around the issue of professionalism, where in the early years of the sport, teams who played in the north felt marginalised and ignored by the RFU, as their desire to pay players for the time they had to take off work to play rugby had fallen on deaf ears. These were called broken time payments. The reason that the RFU didn't want this to happen is that it went against the amateur spirit of the game to pay players. They should be doing this for fun. As they of course made money from the ticket sales from the game. So as you imagine, the excuse was a load of bulls jive. And the northern teams just chose to ignore the RFU and pay its players anyway, which outraged the union, and fines were threatened, words were exchanged, and everyone altogether was a little upset. I've got to say though, for an argument about not spending money, finding someone is weird, isn't it? Like, who does that money go to? Hmm. Anyway, after the fines were threatened, most of the northern teams went, you know what, let's make our own league, where we pay the players, and basically the same thing happened all around the Commonwealth, forming the sport of rugby league, and relatively officially going professional in 1922, which has always slightly depressed me, because imagine how good and popular our sport would be if all these athletes and teams played together in the same sport. Anyway, rugby league went their way, and us uni boys went ours, with both sports doing surprisingly well in what should have been an unmitigated disaster for both sports. And of of course there were casualties and still are to this day, but all in all I think things went better than anyone in hindsight could hope for, with Rugby League gaining a real following in Australia and over here in England having a massive impact too. with its football style professional template being followed, while also having the advantage of being able to pay players, giving them access to some of the best players and athletes in the country. Now you may be wondering to yourself, well how did Rugby Union keep itself afloat when a lot of its best talent was flocking to Rugby League for that sweet sweet Wonga? Well you would be surprised at how much money you save in your game when you aren't paying players what they're worth. <laughs> it's incredible. Then you couple that with the fact that Rugby Union was sort of the original code and had a bit more established already structure wise, whereas rugby league guys were kind of starting from scratch. And rugby union would lean on those structures and values of amateurism for another 73 years. Thinking about that now, that's just mental isn't it? We only organised our first world cup in 1987, but even with a ton of eyes on our sport from both the hardcore fans and new ones, the game stayed amateur. But the pressure was building, especially in the southern hemisphere, with players, benefactors and owners all seeing the massive growth of the game, and the progress and financial benefits Rugby League was gaining. This increased again when the next World Cup in 1991 happened, with Australia winning and England losing to them in the final. The Wallabies players feeling quite rightly that as world champions of the sport around a similar level of popularity worldwide as Rugby League, they should be entitled to be paid for playing, as well as the worldwide brand of the All Blacks picking up even more of a following than before, and it seemed to be more of a matter of when than if the game was going to go professional down south. Over here, progress was slightly slower, there seemed to be a lot less player power going on in England, although players were disgruntled about their lack of financial payment for putting their blood, sweat and tears into playing for their country. They weren't really as outspoken as our southern hemisphere counterparts, because, you know, politics and that. But the game was gaining real popularity, especially at the international level, stadiums always being sold out all over the world, and growing popularity for our sophisticatedly savage sport. It was just undeniable, and I have no doubt that the game was more unofficially semi-pro for players by this point, with the odd match fee, and in England's case, a brand new state-of-the-art mobile phone. But this couldn't continue for very much longer. Rugby was in danger of peaking, and then falling by the wayside with other non-professional sports. And with every futile resistance to change, there is a breaking point. 
and the breaking point for amateurism and rugby union wore the number 11 shirt and his name was Jonah Lomo. Now the 6 foot 5 standing sub 11 second 100 meter running all black legend Jonah Lomo was making a name for himself in the 7th circuit throwing the odd Fijian into the second row and the hype train was well and truly rolling and when that extremely strong choo choo train reached the rugby world cup he blew minds. No one had been as strong and fast in rugby history and people didn't know how to deal with him. I've spoken in other videos about the need for superstars to make sports take off in the eyes of the mainstream and Jonah Lomu was perfect in every way and to this day is the only real true superstar to come out of our game. But what the superstardom of Jonah Lomu did was single-handedly tip the powers that be over the edge in terms of their humming and hawing about whether they wanted the game to go professional as the war between Kerry Packer and Rupert Murdoch was the catalyst that started this movement. With Rupert Murdoch wanting to launch paid television into Australia and needing programming, he turned to rugby league and Kerry Packer understood the value of the lucrative market of professional sport so he turned his attention to rugby union. So then Rupert Murdoch signed up the rugby unions of South Africa, New Zealand and Australia Australia, which would later form the Tri-Nations and Super Rugby, but in a counter move, Packer signed up around 550 of the players within those unions on big money contracts. So things were getting a little tense between the unions and the players. And so the rest of the rugby unions around the world saw this and collectively thought, if we don't secure our players, then they'll be gone before we know it. Rugby unions always had threats of players moving on to play rugby league professionally, but with takeovers on this scale happening and all this uncertainty, chances couldn't be taken. And that's how professionalism spread around the world. It's amazing the role Australian rugby has had in how the rugby world has been shaped. And now rugby over their struggles for relevance. It's a shame. A damn golden shame. But back to professionalism in the game, well over in the Southern Hemisphere it seemed quite natural with Super Rugby being a massive success until they fucked it up with all their franchise nonsense later, but that's a little down the road. But over here things were a bit more messy, first off it basically almost killed Rugby League in Wales as the one thing that it had going for it was that it was pro, and once that was gone, Scott Gibbs and all these other players suddenly returned. As well as in England, suddenly the Premiership became this massive shifting Rubik's Cube when suddenly teams who weren't relevant were suddenly the places to be, which saw clubs like Wasps ransacked for players, and all moving up to the new powerhouse of rugby at the time, which was Newcastle Falcons. And of course professional rugby had its teething problems, like image rights of players, which actually had the England rugby team go on strike in 2000 to try and reach a settlement for not being paid for all the RFU promotions and sponsorships they were all the faces of. Oh RFU, you, you precious cinema buds of love, never change. Actually, you know what, do, because I'm sick of your crap. And speaking of the RFU's constant resistance to doing anything to the benefit of change within the sport, the turn of professionalism of rugby in the UK was actually delayed by over a year, which actually to be fair to them, did us some good, at least at the club level, seeing and hearing about all the potential potholes on the road ahead, with Super Rugby starting off like a house on fire but slowly falling apart when the interest waned. But I guess it's almost a bit of a lottery how things go like this when a sport goes professional, and reviewing how we got here, I can more understand how it could have been scary, especially if you were in the Southern Hemisphere where franchises and unions are to this day still trying to figure out what the best thing to do for their teams is. And I guess the lack of organisation around World Rugby and the uncertainty that our games professional foundations were built on, do lead to problems despite our sport's growing popularity. Like despite the premiership being in my opinion at least in the top two competitions in the world of club rugby, due to its relentless every game means so much motto, there is still talk of ring fencing and making it just like every other competition, as the financial burden of keeping teams in the premiership let alone trying to succeed in it are often unbelievably expensive. And if you want proof of that, Leicester Tigers, the Manchester United of English rugby, almost got relegated this year when they are a club with the financial backing history and international world class players to compete with the best in the league. And they were just a fraction off for most weeks at the start of the season and then found themselves in a relegation battle. When they had a backline at the time, that included Ben Youngs, George Ford, Johnny May, Carl Eastman, Manu Tuolangi, Matt Tabua, and Talisa Vianu. It's a madness. Couple that with the team that actually went down last year being Newcastle Falcons, a team that I've already mentioned earlier in this video as the first to embrace the professional era who've had the best player in the world come through their setup. Which brings me on to my closing thoughts. The history of rugby union being lost was the worry for a lot of people, as well as not wanting the added pressure of finances in a game that was just supposed to be for fun. But I think the game going professional needed to happen and has gone relatively better than anyone could have hoped for. And I hope the stability that the people behind the scenes need can be found in the next few years without sacrificing the drama needed for compelling content on the field. And I hope finding that beautiful midway point isn't just a pipe dream of mine. Signed, 
NGJ.